tape was produced in the spirit of AA's 12th step to carry the message. Members of the fellowship should bear in mind AA's 11th tradition regarding anonymity at the level of press, TV, and films and the use of this tape. Anonymity to this extent is actually the practice of genuine humility. We are sure that humility expressed by anonymity is the greatest safeguard that AA could ever have. My name is Jack, and I am an alcoholic. Hi. I want to say that I know it takes a lot of work to put one of these things together, a lot of unselfish work, a lot of unconditional work, and it's done without a lot of thanks, and it's done so that many other people can benefit and I'm one of those people that have benefited greatly, and I want to thank Lynn and everybody for the great job they did. <clears throat> Before I set out to come up here, I stopped at my little sister's house, and we were shooting the breeze and there was a guy that I didn't I don't know the, this kid that was there he's a friend of my sister's and my brother-in-law's and we were talking and we hit it off pretty good we shot the breeze for about 45 minutes and he said to me so Jack what do you do for excitement <laughs> and I said nothing <laughs> <laughs> I'm not trying to get excited I am excited. <laughs> I'm trying not to get excited. <laughs> My sister wanted me to have something neat. I said, no, I got, I'm going up to New Hampshire. She said, what for? I said, I'm going to a meeting. And she said, you're going all the way up to New Hampshire to go to a meeting? And I said, yep. Yeah. So I'm going to be there for the whole weekend. And she said, you're going to go up to New Hampshire and stay there for the weekend to go to a meeting. And I said, yep. And she said, uh, you still go to a lot of those meetings? And I said, yep. And she said, do you still have to go to a lot of those meetings? And I said, yep. <laughs> and she said, like, even as long as you've been sober? And I said, yep. <laughs> and she said, doesn't that get a little uneventful? And I said, sister, an uneventful Sunday morning for an alcoholic is a big event. <laughs> And, you know, I want to welcome anybody that's new here. I understand there are some people that are relatively new or those that are coming back. If you didn't see it work the first time, you wouldn't be here. And this program really isn't about coming back. It's really about staying here. And I offer that to you as a brother in the fellowship the only thing I want for you is your own improvement. I like to say that, you know, I've heard it said many times, a grateful heart won't drink. And if you're not grateful to be here sober this morning, you don't have to drink either. There'll come a day when no power on this earth will keep you away from a drink. There'll also come a day when no power on this earth will make you drink. Now, I couldn't drink this morning if I wanted to. You would have to hold me down and pour it down my throat. And that is strictly but for the grace of God, as that grace exists in this room this morning when we come together. There's a force in this room right now when we come together. There's a lot of pain and suffering in this room. There's a lot of people that have life or death stories to tell. And there's a great force in this room. It's so powerful, it'll keep us all sober today. And if you want to know how, how powerful it is, come here in a couple of hours when nobody's here and this is an empty room. The force is gone. And if you are new and you're wondering what the grace of God looks like, the grace of God is 143 sober alcoholics in Bedford, New Hampshire on a Sunday morning. 
This is it. And if you're wondering what the grace of God doesn't look like, just picture this place if we were all drinking. <laughs> you know, all the women that have been walking around here, you know, like Lynn and my friend, and you know, without a hair out of place, very well behaved. <laughs> They'd be stumbling around here on the hunt. <laughs> and it wouldn't be for Red October. <laughs> if we needed to send out for a packy run, somebody would say, well, who's going to go? Well, uh, let Fireball Frank go. <laughs> he drives good when he's drunk. You want to go with him? No. no. Every guy under five foot seven that served the United States Navy would be trying to beat me up. Now there's two, four, five, there's six women in this front row. They'd all get in a few, few in them and they'd be secretly trying to think of ways to coerce me to get a hotel room with him tonight. <clears throat> you know what I'm talking about? <clears throat> and I'd be trying to mind my own business. <clears throat> I like to say that my drinking story was a little bit like what happened to Christopher Columbus. He didn't know where he was going. When he got there, he didn't know where he was. When he got home, he didn't know where he had been. And he got a woman to pay for it. <laughs> I had three out of four. All the women I've been with never paid for anything. And that's with good reason. The first question most of the women I've been with asked me was, you're not a police officer, are you? <laughs> Got to wait a couple of seconds for everybody to catch up. <laughs> I am an alcoholic, sober and Alcoholics Anonymous today, but by the grace of God, sober today. I do not keep alcohol where I live. I have never kept alcohol where I live. I said that one night at a beginner's meeting in New York City, and there was, a, there was a row, like right in front of me. And at the end of the row, there was a lady sitting there, and she had a mink on. She had a lot of very expensive jewelry. I found out later she was extremely wealthy. And she never looked at me. She listened to me by looking away. And I remember she had this hairdo. Like, if somebody dropped a bomb on the building, everything would have got destroyed except for that hairdo. <laughs> and when it came her turn to share, she said, oh, I keep alcohol in all my homes. I'd never want any of my friends to think just because I don't drink, they can't. A hmm, couple of things. I don't have any homes <laughs> or aristocratic friends. I'm not overly concerned with what anybody thinks about why I don't keep alcohol where I live. I do have many friends that are recovering heroin addicts, and I don't know one of them that keeps a set of works in the freezer. <laughs> Just in case one of their old friends drops by. Perhaps the greatest thing that's happened to me on a personal level was at some point in time through the, the love that was extended to me through the people in, in this movement, I was given permission to be myself. Many times I said yes when I meant no, I said no when I meant yes because your opinion of me was a lot more important than my opinion of me. And at some point in time, I stopped pretending and started to be true to myself, only through love that was extended to me through the love from the people around here. 
and I was at a meeting one night in Cape Cod, and at the back of the hall there was a guy. He was walking back and forth, and he was glaring at me. I might be a little self-centered, and I might imagine some things, but, you know, I, when somebody, you know, you're not doing it, but this guy's doing it. I think I know who's doing it. And after the meeting was over, the guys we were talking, we were getting ready to leave, and this guy said, hey, Jack. And I, and I walked over, and he said, uh, can I ask you a question? And I said, yes, you may. And he said, uh, how long have you been sober? And I said, quite a while. And he said, you got double-digit sobriety? And I said, yes, I do. And he said, how come you never smile? And I said, can I ask you a question? And he said, yeah. I said, you got double-digit sobriety? He said, yeah. I said, how come you never mind your own business? <laughs> There's only one time I smile. There's only one, the only one time you will ever see me smile. I smile when I feel like it. And I give other people their right to do that also. Very important for wellness to, give, to respect the space of other people. Not to give it to them, but to respect it. You never know where somebody is coming from. You never know about a person's past. You never know. You play games with people, be careful. Be careful. You may walk into somebody that's got a god-awful past, and you may remind them of their father. Huh? Be careful. I've learned that. Respect people's space. And, you know, I had a god-awful run with alcohol. It almost cost me my life. And a god-awful run. But I had all the symptoms of this sickness the very first time I drank. I was a 12-year-old kid. I was getting ready to get on the park and watch the big kids play in a park league championship baseball game. My mother called me upstairs in the morning. I went upstairs. Three of the big kids, they were 15, 16, and 17. They were standing there. One kid's eye was completely shut. He had been stung by a bee in his eye the night before, and he couldn't play. And they came down to get me to play. I said, okay. I went down the park. The place was packed. Everything was bigger. The balls were faster. Everything was bigger. And I was very intimidated by this, but I played. I played second base. I batted ninth. I got three. CNI singles, I scored three runs, I handled all the chances at second base. We won the game. After the game, they gave me a trophy and they took me down the woods where they were going to drink, a planned drinking party. When I got down the woods, the park instructor who'd been a monumental power of example the past three summers, he was perched on top of this rock and he was lushy, slushy, eyes floating around in his head, drunk. As far back as I can remember, I have always been petrified of drunken men and attractive women. <laughs> he gave me a 16-ounce six-pack of cold Budweiser. And I took this, and there was something about it. There was something about it. It carried with it a foreboding. Ominous or otherwise, there was something about it. I walked up the road with my buddy Tommy. God be good to him. We went into our own little spot. <clears throat> sat, I sat down on this rock, and this kid from the team came over. He had a very attractive girlfriend. He came walking over, and he said, Hey, Jack, say hi to Pam. And I said, Hi. I was painfully shy. I had my head down. I was very uncomfortable. You know, water seeks its own level, and so does in wellness. And he was saying nice things about me, and I felt very uncomfortable about it. If you don't have self-esteem, you don't have self-esteem, and I didn't have it. And <clears throat> they tried to make conversation. Seemed I, since they didn't want any part of it, they went away, and I was glad they went away. I cracked open a can of Budweiser. I heard the crack. There was a, an odor. There was a spray, and there was something about it. I started to get light already. I drank half the beer, big burp, drank the other half, flipped it over my shoulder. 
<clears throat> I could see my buddy Tommy looking at me like, where did you learn how to do that? This I liked. Cracked open another can of beer, gurgled it right down, and I could feel his eyes upon me in worship. <laughs> Flipped the can over my shoulder. This other kid from the team come walking over. He also had a very attractive girlfriend. And he said, hey, Jack, say hi to Sue. And in the time it took to drink two 16-ounce cans of Budweiser, I went from someone that did not want to be introduced to someone that suddenly just knew you wanted to be introduced to me. <laughs> and all of a sudden, I sat up like a game rooster. And I'm talking to Sue, and she's talking to me, and we're talking back and forth, and he seemed to sense something was percolating between these two. And he says, come on, let's get out of here. And she quickly pulled her arm and said, no, you go. I'll see you later. And... Oh, it was a miracle what happened to me. It was a miracle. My shoulders got light. My head got light. The more it does for you in the beginning, the more it will take in the end. The more it does for you in the beginning is not significant upon the power of alcohol. It's significant upon the power of sickness that lied within me. And that's all it was significant of. Later that day on a bed, I drank a half a pint of Bacardi rum straight down, and this feeling that I had of being invincible exacerbated. I had my arms around these guys who used to beat us up every day, telling them how much I liked them, how much things were going to be different, how much we're going to do this all the time, and I went into a blackout. I come out of the blackout, two guys were holding me up by my arms, and they were walking me around, and I was throwing up violently. Violent. I was throwing up so bad, I thought I was vomiting my organs. And I re remember looking down at my private area, and I noticed it was soaking wet. Obviously, somebody had spilt a beer on me when I was passed out. <laughs> Still pisses me off to this day. Somehow, I got home undetected. The next morning, I woke up from a very sleepless sleep because all night long, I was bristling with excitement. Blacking out is a very intense emotional experience. Throwing up is a very intense physical experience. Pissing yourself is a very intense embarrassing experience. If I had all those experiences from drinking this type of water, I'd go to a hospital. And I'd never drink this again. I woke up the next morning. I had those experiences. As far as I was concerned, that had been the greatest day of my life, and I couldn't wait to do it all over again. <laughs> and you have to be very spiritually sick to identify with that. And I know as I stand here this morning that, at that on that day I told myself the biggest lie I have ever told myself in my entire life. Be careful of the lies you tell yourself because they're the hardest ones to undo. Be careful of the lies you tell yourself, especially about other people, especially about other people that you don't even know, that you've never even had a cup of coffee with. You know, because when good things start happening to you around here, very subtly, it's very easy to start taking credit for the good things. And when you start taking credit for the good things, you also start taking credit for the bad things. Next thing you know, you're judging the living shit out of everybody, and you've developed this great sense of false pride. And you've eased God out. Take it from a guy that knows. And all you really need to do is turn that around and just start saying thank you. Start saying thank you a hundred times a day, and you can turn it around. And that day I told myself the lie that my problem in life was I was sober. That was my problem. That was the biggest lie I've ever told myself. By the nature of that lie, I've overdosed on narcotics. 
I voluntarily put poison in my body in an effort to take my life, and I sat in a hotel room in Brockton, Massachusetts, with a loaded 38 special, just trying to psych myself up to pump a bullet in my brain. And the nat nature of that was believing that lie. My story, for the sake of brevity, it's just one of spiritual decay, slow, steady, spiritual decay, like the effect that water has on porcelain. In the beginning, it doesn't look like it's too much of a problem. It ends up putting a hole in it, and I put a hole in my soul. And, you know, the towards the end of my drink, and I, I drank in this, I went to this particular bar. I was shut off in a thousand different bars, defaulted on a thousand different loans, owed everybody $10. Nobody wanted nothing to do with me, and I had gone to this bar that I had been to years before, and I knew the kid that was tending bar there, and he told me that, he said, I'll give you all the draft beer you want for nothing. And I sat there, I drank, I passed out, drank, passed out. Come closing time, I was passed out in the corner, had pissed myself a couple of times. These guys didn't know what to do with me. One guy knew where my mother lived. They took me down my mother's house, went around back, opened the door. There was a rack there, and they threw me on the rack, and they took off. The next morning, I, when I woke up, I could not believe where I was. I had already violated one restraining order on me there. I have nine other brothers and sisters. I could hear them chatting away upstairs, and I knew that they did not know I was there. Otherwise, the conversations would have been different. And I just suddenly knew I had to get out of there and get out of there right away. And I get up to walk out, and there was a mirror. <clears throat> it had been my mirror when I lived there. And in the corner of the mirror, there was a little picture. There was a picture. I was about eight years old. Three of my brothers and sisters were in the back of this little red wagon that we had. We were all smiling. We all had our shirts off. And I remember I stood there and I looked at the picture. And I said to myself, Whatever happened to that little guy? Whatever happened to that guy that used to pull a little red wagon and stick up for his brothers and sisters? And I wanted some answers. And I know from that day to the last day that I drank, I drank with a broken heart, and, and I drank with a broken spirit. Not too long after that, I came to Alcoholics Anonymous. I came here. I had no reason why I wanted to live another day. There's no reason in my life why I wanted to live another day. I, I came here, I just wanted to be dead. That's all I wanted. I just wanted to be dead. I didn't know why that was so hard. I just wanted to be dead. And I came here. I came here and I was a kid in my 20s. AA quickly became the most important thing in my life. Because it has, I have stayed sober through my 20s, through my 30s, through my 40s. My sobriety has been continuous and uninterrupted. During that entire period of time, I have never woken up, never once, and said to myself, gee, I wish I drank yesterday. I've never had more gratitude than after a drunk dream, because right about the time you realize it was only a dream, you'll feel a surge of gratitude, because seconds before, you really thought you lost the gift. There's three things you can do with this disease sober. You can turn it inside and it will eat you up. You can turn it outside and look for trouble, or you can change. 
I do a little bit of all three. The only claim I make before you this morning is that I have made spiritual progress. I'm not a saint. I have made spiritual progress, not perfection. That I have done. And the I have learned, and, and listen up because I'm only going to say this once. I have learned the only thing you get away with is the truth. The most powerful mind-altering drug is the truth. You want to see somebody get high blood pressure? Know that they've told a lie and confront them with the truth. Take it from a guy that knows. You can get away with things, shameful conduct, scams. Yes, you can. It's the getting away with it that becomes the curse you won't be able to live with. You can bury lies. Yes, you can. But they're buried alive. The only thing you get away with is the truth. The first truth I needed to learn about was the truth about alcohol. Alcohol never made me anything I wasn't. I never became a pro football player, an Einstein, or a great soprano singer, whether I was drunk or sober. <clears throat> Alcohol never told me to do anything. It don't have a mouth. It can't talk. The character defects I displayed under the influence of alcohol came from me, not alcohol. Alcohol isn't cunning, baffling, and insidious. If alcohol was cunning, baffling, and insidious, everybody that drank it would become cunning, baffling, and insidious. If this was a fifth of Jack Daniels, I want you to act cunning, baffling, and insidious. Alcohol isn't cunning, baffling, and insidious. I am. When I drink alcohol, it releases me from my inhibitions, and my inhibitions become my exhibitions. My job today regarding alcohol is not to put a question mark where God has put a period. And I do that to surrendering, to needing your help, and that there's somebody here that needs mine. The greatest transition in my life, by nothing, regarding alcohol is that one day in my life I could not picture my life without alcohol. This morning I cannot picture my life with alcohol. Wow. And that is strictly but for the grace of God. I was on top of Bill Wilson's grave one day 20 years ago. Went up there. It's a good thing to do. Anybody, you got some spare time to kill, you think sobriety's boring, take a trip up to Bill's grave and say a prayer. Great thing to do. I went up to Wilson's grave and I stood on his grave and it was a very dark, dank, drizzly, overcast day like it's been the last few days. It was a day, I didn't feel like drinking, but it was certainly a day that reminded me of drinking. And I wanted to say a prayer out loud with the person I was with, but I would have broke down. You know, occasionally on the yellow brick road of sobriety, the old self and the new self will come together, and it's almost like you can stand in the middle and see, see the great tragedy you were and the person that you have an opportunity to be and how much the drastic change is from when we're drinking and when we're sober. And it was one of those days, and I was so overcome with gratitude. I would, if I'd have said anything verbally, I would have broke down. So I thought the Our Father. At the end of the prayer, this very quiet, egoless thought ran through my mind. Just remember, if you had anything to do with you getting sober, you never would have got sober. That's not the case for everybody in this room. That's the case for me. And I haven't been the same guy since. I read a book one time, I'm okay, you're okay. I didn't like the book. I didn't like the name of the book. If I was ever going to write a book, the name of the book would be I'm not okay, and you're not okay, <laughs> but that's okay. <laughs> I get screwed up every day. I wonder about alcoholics that don't get screwed up every day. I get screwed up every day, a little bit. 
I stopped being a nice guy. I'm not a nice guy. I stopped being a nice guy. Maybe that day will come. Religion is for people that don't want to go to hell. Spirituality is for people that have been to hell. I've been to hell. It's important for me to take the risk of being myself. That's why we have 12 steps, because I need to go inside and look at what brought me to hell. Because if I don't do that, I can be a nice guy one second, and the next second I'm throwing haymakers with the guy out in the middle of the square because he didn't have his directional on. There was a whole cesspool of things inside of me that I needed to bring out in the open. of a crazy day or crazy five minutes. Let you read it. I say, yeah, is this guy in a nut house? No, he should be. All my life I tried to please you or control you, and it did not work, so I quit. When you realize how hard it can be to make a change in yourself, you begin to see the impossibility of changing anybody else. You can enjoy people or try to control them. You do one or the other, but not both. If I'm overreacting to somebody's behavior, I'm trying to control it. Control is spiritual quicksand. It's not what you hang on to, it's what you let go of. Let go of what? Old attitudes and old ideas. When I first got sober, they had this like AA voodoo. And I remember, the old timers running around and, and newcomers, like, these are things that you do. You feel like drinking? Eat candy. You have a drunk dream? Eat ice cream. Got a resentment? Write it down on a piece of paper. Swallow it. If it doesn't pass today, it'll pass tomorrow. <laughs> And I remember people running around, did you write it down? Did you swallow it? I realize that because I'm, I don't, I don't get afraid, I am afraid. I get spiritual. I'm a six foot. I spent 22 years, four months, and nine days in the Marine Corps. Big cover up. I don't get afraid, I am afraid. I get spiritual a day at a time through my higher power. It's either let go and let God or let go and let Jack. It's either but for the grace of God or but for the grace of Jack. One way makes me bitter, one way makes me better. I've been given a choice. And I was, I'm a resentment machine. Somebody does something, I don't do anything, I don't say anything. When I'm by myself, I replay it over and over again in my mind, trying to get a different result, and it never changes, because it already happened. The hardest things we let go of have already happened. And I didn't learn how to handle a resentment, I learned how to master a resentment. I can't handle a resentment. I can't handle a resentment no more than I can handle a drink of alcohol. I learned how to master a resentment. Allow other people to be spiritually sick. Avoid retaliation or argument. Ask God for a kind and tolerant thought. Poof! You have no power over me. You have power when I give you the power by feeding it with, with resentments and self-pity. Envy, jealousy, yeah, feed it, create it, and then hold you responsible. Shift the responsibility for how I feel onto you. I had a resentment against this teacher. I was in the ninth grade for years. I used to go to Thanksgiving Day football games, smothered, blackout drunk, looking up in the stands, seeing if I could see this guy. I wanted to find out where he lived so I could rent a plane, drop a bomb on his house. <laughs> and I'm not a pilot. When I went through the, the steps, I'm resentful at Mr. E. He made, my, I've been wearing these glasses in school. I found these glasses outside of the school. They were broken. I brought them in. I put them on. Everybody was laughing at me. He's writing something on the blackboard, and he says, John, get up in front of the class and bring your glasses. 
You know, I'm a 14 karat alcoholic. I would rather die than look bad. I didn't want to, he said, bring your glasses, come up in front of the class, I'm going to send you down to the principal's office and you're going to be expelled for five days. I get up in front of the class and suddenly I felt like I did when my old man put me on the spot. And I, I had all I could do not to break down. Then he finally said, all right, go ahead, sit down. I was resentful at Mr. E. He embarrassed me, affects my self-esteem. I was selfish. I did not want him to embarrass me. I was dishonest. I was high on alcohol. I was high on angel dust. I was high on other narcotics. I was self-seeking. He told me a thousand times to pay attention. He told me a thousand times to knock it off. He kept me after school and said, Jack, I want to talk to you man to man. You're disrupting the class. I'd appreciate it if you'd knock it off. He told me a thousand times. I was frightened. I was frightened of what everybody else in that classroom thought of me because I didn't say nothing to them. That was the exact nature of the wrongs. I was doing it myself, and I was shifting the responsibility for my behavior onto him. When I saw the truth, I was shocked. All those years, I was shocked. I owed this guy an apology. If I was a teacher and I had somebody like that in my class, I'd imagine that would tick me off a little bit. The truth will set you free, and it's the only thing that sets you free. So I don't have to live that way anymore. You know, God is not going to remove from me anything that I won't let go of. It's not what you hang on to, it's what you let go of. God never knocked a drink out of my hands. And God is not going to remove from me anything I won't let go of. I do my job. He does his job. I row the boat. God steers. I can steer any time I want to. But God don't row. When I'm steering, there's nobody rowing. I've made amends in this program. Nothing has moved my spirit on a physical level like making amends. And that was something I was never going to do. Loaded with false pride. I don't say I'm sorry. I screw up. I screw up. I came to a point in my sobriety and I was meditating one day and I did more LSD than anybody I ever met in my entire life. I know what a bad trip is like. I know what a good trip's like too. And I was meditating and I had to open my eyes because it felt like the floor was like this. Every time I closed my eyes, the floor was tilted. A thought came to me, today is the day you make amends to your mother. There will be no further spiritual progress until this is done. Divine union does not precede human interaction. Karma is worked out on a physical level first, then we move forward. You know, if I got an attitude towards women and I become a priest for 50 years, when I come out, I still got an attitude. You can run, but you can't hide. I went down my mother's house without delay. Went in my mother's house. We could all, I could invite everybody down my mother's house right now. Take about six buses down there. You'd go in, there's something on the stove. There's half a dozen people there. Somebody's playing cribbage. There's a stray cat or a parakeet running around. And that's the way it's always been my whole life. I walked into my mother's house this day. The place was squared away. It looked like it was ready for inspection. She's sitting at the head of the table. Nobody else was there. I've never seen the house like that before or since. I came in. I sat down. I said, how you doing, Ma? She says, good. How you doing? I said, good. I said, you know, um, I've been sober quite a while now. She goes, I know. You're doing good. I said, uh, I'm involved in a... The program that I'm in requires a lot more than just not drinking. She said, okay. I said, I, I came here today to do something, and I think it's going to be kind of difficult. She said, okay. And I began to cry. And my tears turned into sobs. I didn't go there thinking this was going to happen. I began to sob like a baby. She said, uh, you know something? You, you don't have to do this. That's okay. And I put my hand up, and she said, oh, you got to do this for yourself? And I said, yeah. And I said, um, 
you know, all the embarrassments. The last time I was arrested was for five accounts of armed robbery. It was all over the newspaper. It was all over the radio. They said bail at $500,000, $100,000 for each charge. My mother had to put the $50,000 of cash surety up. She had to put the house up. She came down to the police station in her house coat with my sister, who was two, and my brother, who was three. And I went on a litany of things that I had done, and I said, you know, I came here today to tell you that I'm sorry. I'm sorry about all that. And she said... Um, she got up, she walked around, she came behind me, she rubbed the back of my head, and she said, um, I love you. And I said, I love you too. I don't ever remember my mother telling me that she loved me. I don't ever remember saying that to her. Nobody ever said that to her either. Her love has always been evident in her labors. My father left a long time ago. My mother raised ten kids. No days off for my mother. Her love was in her actions. And you know, for a number of years, I was sober over 10 years at that time, and I just couldn't see it, to be quite honest with you. I was playing this game, you did this, but I did that, you did this, I did that. You get your dignity back around here the same way you lose it, through your own actions, nothing else. I'm not responsible for what other people do or what other people think. I'm only responsible for what I do. That's all. And you know... I walked out of my mother's house that day, and people started to come in, and there's been many times in sobriety when I have felt so tormented by self-centeredness, so twisted up, I was so locked up in myself, and I just knew if you looked at me, you could see it. And I wished that there was something I could do, you know, I could take a drink of this water, and this metamorphosis would take place on the inside, like, wow. You know, and I could be freed from that self-centeredness. Well, part of it happened on that day. All the feelings that I felt, those were the healing feelings. Like when somebody dies and you feel sad, it's the feelings of sadness that are the healing feelings. That's what you want to feel. I walked out of my mother's house that day. I wanted to walk up to a complete stranger and say, Hey, you, you made amends to your mother yet? Where do you live? California? Come on, let's go to the airport. I used to think that taking personal inventory and when we're wrong, promptly admitted it, I misinterpreted that for years. That, to me, was an amends step. Look at your behavior. If you didn't screw up, good. Success. And I found out it's a lot more than that. Like, mind your own business. Like, that's not a sarcastic thing. Like, mind, use your mind and look at your business. Very important if you want to change. Because I had become like a, a shit magnet. You know, people would do things to me. People would get in my space, and I'd accept it under the auspices that acceptance was the answer to all my problems. And I'd toss and turn all night long in resentment. And I found out that when people get in my space and they start acting cruel or mean, I have other rights. And I better exercise those rights. And I have also found out that karma is like that. I can leave this place here, perhaps if I had a resentment, I could go to Egypt, Turkey, California, and the same behavior keeps happening, but only with other people, until I do what I need to do and say what I need to say. If you don't hand it back, you'll pass it on. And not too long ago, my sister adopted this little guy from Moscow, my little pal, Mr. Evan. He was two, now he's four. And me and him have been like this. He gives me permission to be a little boy. And I be a little boy. You can't give me that. You have to possess it. He has it. He gives me permission to do something that I wasn't given permission to do. Be a little boy. And I'm sitting at home one morning about 0500. The phone rings. It's my brother-in-law. He's up to the hospital. 
what's going on? He said, Evan was, he had the croup. They brought him up to the hospital like 2 o'clock in the morning. For all those people that are starting to yawn and fall asleep, I'll wake you up when it's over. So, okay. I know you got a bunch of chow in your stomach. It's okay. Night, night. Um, she said, we're up the hospital. He said, we're up the hospital. Evan was crouping, whatever. We didn't know what to do. I said, how long have you been there? He said, two, since two. He, was, he, gave, he got a half a day admittance. He said, can you go buy the house? All we got is what he had on him. Can you go get him a change of clothes, a book, a juice, bring it up here? We're going to be here till about noontime. I said, yeah. He said, just tell the lady at the desk that, you know, who you, who you are, what the name is, and they'll send you up here. We're on the fourth floor. I said, all right. And I get off the phone. Because I go to a lot of meetings and because there is a higher power in my life, I was so happy. I'm like... I'm a guy that used to piss myself, blackout, throw up. There was restraining orders on me through this program. My brother-in-law is calling me up and asking me to go to his house, which I have a key to, and bring stuff up to the hospital. I'm like, yippee. Went to the house. I got about six different outfits. <laughs> about eight books, six toys. Half a dozen different juice drinks. I go walking into the hospital. It looked like I was getting ready to be admitted myself. I get stuff over here, and I walk in, and I said to the lady at the desk, I told her what the name was, and she looks in the computer, and she says, there's nobody here by that name. And I said, my brother-in-law just called me. She said, well, the people on the floor, they'll put it in the system. She said, it's not here. She called up. I said, well, he said he's on at the computer and um, she looks up above her glasses looks back she's typing away I'm standing there for about 20 seconds finally she says can I help you and I said yes you may she goes back to typing I said I want to see my my sisters here my brother-in-law with my nephew what's the name I give her the name. She goes, there's nobody here by that name. I said, I see my brother-in-law right there. I hear this little buzz. She says, are you coming in or not? I said, yeah, I'm coming in. So I walk in, I walk over there. My sister said, what's the matter? I said, no, nothing, I'll tell you later. So my little pal, and as soon as he saw me, the little white teeth, hi, Uncle Jack kid felt better immediately. <laughs> so we played for a couple hours. About 11 o'clock, the doctor comes in. He looked at He gave him a prescription, talked to my sister. She said, okay, you can leave now. So we're walking out. They go off. I said, I'm going to take a leak. They go in the head. I'm taking this water buffalo whiz <laughs> and I can and, my, and the lady says to my sister uh, who was that guy that came up here earlier and she said oh, that was my brother and she says uh, boy he was in a bad mood all of a sudden the whiz stopped <laughs> I'm walking out I, I walked over and I said uh, <clears throat> I said what'd you say uh, I, I was in a great mood when I came up. I was in a great mood until I met you. <laughs> you, you. You told me that, you said you didn't put it in the system. That's why the lady downstairs didn't know you, uh, they were here. Then you told me they weren't here. If I'd have left what, because of what you said, I never would have saw them. I was in a great mood. She turned the red of blood, and she never said a word. She couldn't say a word. And my sister said, uh, eh, come on, let's, let's get going. We went on the elevator, and she said, boy, that really bothered you, huh? I said, yeah, it did. <clears throat> we got outside. My nephew wanted me to come back to the house. We went back to, the, to his house. I said, I'll go back. He's going to pass out in a minute anyway. We go back to the house. The kid, poor kid was burnt. He walks in the house. I walk in behind him. He gets two pillows he walk, and a blanket, puts them on the kitchen floor, and when he gets tired, he doesn't say anything. He just makes body movements. He goes, huh? Ah. Okay, I laid down. 
He laid on his pillow, he stuck his thumb in his mouth. I laid on the other pillow, stuck my thumb in my mouth. <laughs> it was a night-night. By the time I got through stroking his head, he was out. If I didn't say what I needed to say to the nurse, I never would have been able to appreciate an intimate and tender moment with my nephew because I'd have been compulsive. i got to get out of here. If you don't hand it back, you pass it on. Next thing you know, I'm pulling some guy over at a light because he didn't have his directional on. The guy that tips over the dining room table that's mad at his wife, he didn't say what he had to say to his boss. If you don't hand it back, you pass it on. As far as I'm concerned, acceptance is a suck word for an alcoholic. Well, I accept things that I can't change. Yes. With courage, we change the things we can. Ask a doctor, a lawyer, a cop, a mother, a teacher, if acceptance is the answer to all their problems. Accept the things that I can't change. With courage, I change the things we can. To sin by silence when one should protest will make a coward out of you. It certainly made one out of me for a long time. And it's very important when I feel those high-intensity feelings about a situation, it's very important to speak my peace. And a lion's courage can rest beneath a sheep's coat. You don't have to be big to say things that are. And... You know, I think part of the reason that I was called to come here this morning was like a higher power thing. Um, I've been going to a lot of discussion meetings lately, and for some reason there's always arguments about God, the nature of God. There was a lady at a meeting that I was at in Dorchester just recently, and she's, uh, she, got, she was all hostile, and she's saying, you know, if God was a man, I never would have got sober. Um, <laughs> Some other guy that's been around since the Last Supper, he puts his hand up and he says, you know, our father, and back and people taking sides. And that's why I think half the reason I was asked to come here this morning was to straighten this out. <laughs> God is not a man. Have no fear, God is not a man, and God is not a woman. God is certainly a lot more than a gender. God's a Marine. <clears throat> okay. However wonderful it is, to live your life in service to others, it will not be anything but disastrous to live your life for others as others think you should live it. One should therefore, for better or for worse, live your own life. Alcoholics Anonymous is a spiritual program. The nature of spirituality is truth. Only the truth can lead us to freedom. It is a one-way street. We get there by sharing our experiences, a beautiful blending of our souls, sometimes by giving and sometimes by taking, but always by sharing. And from our sharing, we have found that nowhere is it more evident than in Alcoholics Anonymous that strength can come from weakness, that what can work against us can work for us, for after all, it was our alcoholism that should have killed us and our alcoholism that has launched us on the great adventure of sobriety. Success in sobriety depends not on occupation or intelligence or status of any kind, but upon what we can transmit. By clearing away the wreckage of our past, keeping our own house in order, and abandoning ourselves to God as we understand God. Alcoholics Anonymous is the only place you will ever go where an ex-street drunk prescribes for a doctor, where a former lush counsels a lawyer, or where a priest is spared the last rites by a sober wino. 
we all have the same opportunity to sink in fear or float in faith. Life is not an excuse. I am not a victim. I have a choice to communicate with providence and rise above anything life throws my way. Knock, and the door shall be opened. Ask, and ye shall receive. Seek, and ye shall find. Not maybe, and holy promises are always fulfilled. I left a detox commitment one night, and a wise old gentleman told me, if I was faithful to the prescription of Alcoholics Anonymous, I would never appear anywhere as a patient for having this disease, and days would come when I'd be privileged to be a guest because I'm treating it. This morning, on behalf of this New Hampshire convention, I am privileged to be one of your guests. I am privileged, I am honored to be your guest. And as your guest, I want to say to that one, someone, somebody that's new in this hall this morning or coming back, welcome to Alcoholics Anonymous. If you've hit some potholes in your sobriety, and oh, those potholes can appear to be so big, sometimes, yes, they can. And maybe you thought to yourself, ah, big deal, so I didn't drink yesterday. Big deal, so I didn't drink last week. Big deal, so I haven't drank for a month. My dear friend, if you call yourself an alcoholic and you didn't drink today, that's a big deal. Please don't ever minimize that. Please don't ever underestimate that. And please don't ever take that for granted. Because most alcoholics will never say that. Most alcoholics will die shortly after their last drink or medically from a drink or from a drinking episode. And this is the case, unless the sickness is interrupted. Our sickness has been interrupted here this morning. And were any of us of and by ourselves capable of interrupting it? May we never minimize, underestimate, or take for granted this gift of sobriety that is ours. You people have been very, 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 very kind to me here this morning. You have given me your patience, your tolerance, and your understanding. You have shed on me here this morning more human warmth than perhaps I felt as a kid during my entire childhood. And to you people, I remain very grateful. Thank you.